With primary season upon us, a major question facing Republican candidates. Is it still the grand old party? or now the party of Donald Trump. The former president still looms large over party politics, but some, like Illinois Congressman Adam Kinzinger, are calling it quits over the political litmus test that requires loyalty to the former president and the agenda that lost him the White House in 2020. My next guest has spent years exploring how the party of Reagan became the modern day GOP. The book is called Insurgency, How Republicans Lost Their Party and Got Everything They Ever Wanted. Author and New York Times correspondent Jeremy Peters joins me this morning to talk about it. Jeremy, good to see you. Congratulations on the book. I've read it cover to cover. Good job. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So I want to start actually with this point, because the title Insurgency, most people are going to think, oh, this guy wrote this thing about January 6th. And, and, and the, the, but you started this book back in 2017, which means that title, maybe it incorporates January 6th, but you're talking about a lot of stuff that happened before that, and it even goes back to Pat Buchanan and Sarah Palin. Right, because I initially saw this book as trying to uh, attempt to really to tell the story of why the Republican Party had been uh, so susceptible to upheavals that eventually tossed out its top leadership. And you, you've you seen this throughout its his modern history, um, going uh, back to George H.W. Bush um, and his defeat in 1992, his, the, the, the Challenged by Pat Buchanan that, that you referenced in in uh, in that year, um, right up through the Tea Party, uh, and then up to Donald Trump. So, in my attempt to explain the kind of destabilizing environment in, in this party, uh, I don't think I quite foresaw that it would end uh, as violently as it did on January 6th. I mean, the, the the title all along has, was going to be insurgency, and it was you know just in, in an unfortunate um, twist of events that, you know, in, in hindsight actually seem pretty predictable yeah. and fitting with the increasingly radicalized nature of the Republican Party today. And that's why I wanted to open there to let people know this is much broader than a book that's just January 6th forward. You know, of course, many of our viewers are Illinois based here, and so you uh, actually open uh, early part of the book with a discussion of Illinois Representative and Adam Kinzinger, um, who I've always viewed as a very concerned conservative traditional Republican. You juxtapose him with Texas Republican Representative Ronnie Jackson, who of course people may remember was Trump's uh, uh, doctor who said he'll live to be 200. Uh, he's now a congressman in Texas. And you say it's Ronnie Jackson who's the norm, not Adam Kinzinger. Which is such a remarkable turn of events, but I think uh, a, a, an ideal um, continuation of the increasingly radical direction the party has taken. Look, I mean, Adam Kinzinger, as you know, was considered um, Tea Party. In back in 2010, he was the party's hard right. You know, these fiscal conservatives um, who came in promising to change Washington and kind of lay waste to businesses as. It was usually done. Um, well, 10 years later, he is no longer a, a, a renegade. He is considered by most Republican voters to be somebody who's who's you know quote unquote establishment. Right. And that is, I think, the story of the Republican Party. It's how it has you know increasingly become captive to a base of voters that are not going to be pleased. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that it's it's cyclical this way, and it really raises a question about what's next, because if, if this is just the middle of the story, I don't know what the end is. Well, and let me give you a twist on what's next, because here in Illinois, by the way, in our gubernatorial race, we have one candidate who identifies very closely with, with former President Trump, another one who is Republican, but basically is distancing himself from President Trump. And I'm sort of curious, as you've done all the work that you've done, what influence do you see the president happening, not so much maybe in a future presidential election, but in these more local elections, in you know, in governor races and, and, and secretary of state races, given the fact that in the Texas primaries that just happened, um, Trump went 33 for 33 in his endorsements. 
Mm -hmm. Well, right now and for the foreseeable future, Donald Trump is the center of gravity in the party. He is the source from which all political or most political power flows. There will be the isolated few um, like Adam Kinzinger, Liz Cheney. Now, of course, Kinzinger isn't running again. Uh, and, and Liz Cheney is facing an incredibly stiff primary challenge. But for now, the way that Republicans believe they get elected is by backing Donald Trump. And it's it's more than just backing him. It's imitating him and parroting his language and his attitude. Because what Trump, who's a pretty unideological guy, has done to the Republican Party is turn it into a party that is less about ideas uh, than it is um, attitude and sty it's stylistic conservatism as somebody i talked to for the book described it it's this notion that you know it doesn't so much matter what you're for as who you're against and how aggressively you antagonize those opponents and as long as as the voters believe that your opponents are their opponents their enemies then that's going to be good for you politically and nobody is has better been better at that um, at, at setting the tone that way than and Donald Trump, who, of course, picks fights uh, left and right, and, yeah. and including with Republicans whose careers he's, he's ended. Yeah, and did you make that point? Both Donald Trump, Sarah Palin, they understood that the key was in who doesn't like you and dealing with them even more so than who does like you. As we go through this election season, a lot of people look at the 2020 election and all the calls that it was, uh, it was stolen and all this kind of stuff, and people think, well, that's where this whole notion started. But you give us history in the book. You take us back to Roger Ailes, who I actually worked with years ago in, in, in his NBC News role, uh, who, of course, is the, was the father of, of Fox News, and when Mitt Romney lost the election, you say that he got together with Roger Ailes, and Ailes says to him, oh, don't worry, Mitt, because they, Democrats, cheat. This, this notion right. goes further back. Oh, it, it does. I mean, and I could take you back uh, even further. Um, it, it goes back to people, conservative activists like Phyllis Schlafly, who ran for uh, the head of a Republican women's, um, a national Republican women's group back in the 60s. And when she didn't win, guess what? She said it was stolen. The thing was rigged. Um, so this, this notion that your enemies are cheating you has really been embedded in the Republican voter for as long as we can remember. And it, it was given voice by Trump in a way and a legitimacy on the right in a way that it hadn't had before. Because always you know, these, these people who complained that the polls were rigged or that the ballots bo ballot boxes had been stuffed were generally seen as kind of sore losers. And that was accepted. But around the time that you describe in, in 2012, there's a real shift that starts to take place. And I think that's the point at which the Republican Party, you can begin to see, becomes Okay. less yeah. tethered to reality because what they did before they insisted that Obama had cheated uh, was they were saying the polls were lying to people that the that you know the quote unquote democrat controlled media uh, was lying to voters about how popular Mitt Romney was now of course the polls were not rigged they happened to be very on point in that election but it's there that you can begin to see the 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 seeds of mistrust really being sown uh, in the republican voter where you know a lot of them did, at this point don't believe Believe anything they see in the mainstream media, um, and they won't, I think, believe any political loss that they suffer uh, is is legitimate. Uh, and Jeremy, we're out of time, but before we do, I've got to ask you just a quick question. Crystal ball time for you. As we look ahead to these elections, let's assume Republicans take control of the House, maybe even the Senate. History might tell us that that is going to happen. Are the next two years of the Biden presidency full of more Hillary Gates and investigations, or do we see legislation in an attempt to come out of Congress? Well, I, when Republicans had the chance to legislate in the Trump years, they didn't do it. They passed a tax cut, and that was it. They couldn't repeal Obamacare. They couldn't deliver. Let's not forget, they really don't agree on 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 much um, in terms of policy these days. They're not really a policy party. They're a, they're a party of being anti-left. So the irony is, of course, if if they assume power, um, like like we imagine they will, like history suggests they will. They're going to be in the majority, but they're going to continue acting like the opposition party, and that's going to be to grind down the Democrats and try to tell their voters, convince their voters that those people are the enemy, so you have to keep us in power.
Jeremy Peters, the book is fascinating. Insurgency, how Republicans lost their party and got everything they wanted. Again, it's not just about January 6th. This takes us way back and really explains so many things as to why things are the way they are today and helps us look forward. Jeremy Peters, The New York Times, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on great work. Thank you. I really appreciate it.